Can I remind members, visitors and those in the public gallery to please ensure their mobile phones are switched off or in flight mode for the duration of this meeting as they interfere with the broadcasting equipment even when on silent mode. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official leader by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. We will now proceed to consideration of the, the sec Sectoral Employment Order, Electrical Contracting Sector 2019. In accordance with Dáil Standing Order 84A 4K, and Shannon Standing Order 713 k the Sectoral Employment Order Electrical Contracting Sector 2019 has been referred to this committee by orders of Dáil and Shannon Aaron. The committee has been asked to send a message to the Dáil not later than the 30th of May and to the Shannon not later than today, stating that it has completed its consideration of the order. I would like to welcome Minister Breen and his officials to the meeting and thank them for the brief briefing material provided. I now invite Minister Breen to make his opening statement. Um, <coughs> thank you very much indeed, Carl Herlock, and I'm delighted to be back here again uh, with the other SEO and thank the committee for being present uh, this afternoon and um, I'm, I'm pleased to present the, the committee for consideration the draft sectoral employment order for the electrical contracting sector. The draft ministerial order is made under section 17 of the Industrial uh, Relations Amendment Act 2015. The intention is that this order will confirm the rates of pay, pension and sick pay entitlements for defined workers in the electrical contracting sector. This is the first of such order for the electrical contracting sector. The current matter before the Labour the current matter came before the Labour Court by way of an application pursuant to section 14 of chapter 3 of part 2 of the Industrial Relations Amendment Act 2015 by the Connect Trade Union which represents an excess of 9800 workers in the sector. Also the Association of Electrical Contractors Ireland AECI who represent about 190 electrical contractors implying 2250 and the Electrical Contractors Association, that's the ECA, who represent 40 electrical contractors implying in excess of 4,000 workers of the class, type or group to which the request relates in the given sector, which they submitted in a defined economic sector for the purposes of the 2015 Act. Having examined the submission and the accompanying supporting materials, the court was satisfied that the applicants are substantially, substantially representative, representative of the workers of the particular class type or group in the economic sector in respect of which the request is expressed to apply. The court then, as is required to do so, published its intention to undertake an examination of the union and employer's request and invited submissions from the interested parties. Written submissions were received from nine interested parties. The Association of Electrical Contractors Ireland, the Electrical Contractors Association, the Electrical Contractors Safety and Standards Association Ireland, CLG, the National Electrical Contractors Ireland, the Small Firms Association, the Construction Workers Pension Scheme, Connect Trade Union, Dolores Rogers of Kinetic Electrical, and Mr. Kieran Fitzpatrick, an individual. Can I say to the members present, some of the submissions supported the applications, others did not. A public hearing was held on the 14th of March 2019. <coughs> Excuse me. All interested parties were given an opportunity to be heard. Seven of the nine interested parties attended the hearing, and can I say to all of you, engaged extensively with the court. Having considered the matter, the Labour Court reached a decision to make a recommendation. And in making its recommendation, the Labour Court had to consider the factors set out in Section 16.2 of the Act. This includes the potential impact of the making of an order on levels of employment and unemployment in the identified economic sector. The potential impact on competitiveness in the economic sector concerned and that the sectoral employment order would be binding on all workers and employers in the economic sector concerned. So in accordance with the Act, the recommendation was submitted to me for approval on the 23rd of April 2019. 
I considered the recommendations in line with the terms of the 2015 Act, relying on the statutory report outlining the Labour Court's deliberative, uh, deliberative process in reaching its recommendation. And I notified the Court on the 9th of May 2019 that it accepted its recommendations. And a draft of the order was laid before the Houses on the 9th of May 2019, as required by Section 17.4 of the 2015 Act. I hope that all the committee members here today will recognise the importance of ensuring stability in employment terms and conditions in this sector. And I refer this matter back to both Houses for approval so that the order can, can be given legal effect. Members, when the order comes into effect, their terms will be binding across the sectors and enforceable by the Workplace Relations Commission, the WRC. The electrical contracting sector order will be effective on the 1st of September 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, any comments? Yes, I'd just like to welcome Senator the Minister Reilly. and his team, and I'd like to welcome this initiative because I think it's important that people do have some certainty around their pay, their pension in particular too, and their sick pay entitlements. So, well done, Minister. Thank you. Senator Humphreys, have you any comments? I'm Patrick. Deputy Quinn Yeah, just welcome the Minister, welcome the, um, their pay rise of 2.7 percent from the 1st of September and ship in forces. So thank okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think it's very, very important that the rates of pay, pension and sick pay entitlements for defined workers in the electrical contracting se sector are defined. It's very, very important. And like, like the order that came before us two weeks ago, it is very, very welcome and it puts things on um, a statutory footing. Um, you stated there that um, where was it? So this is going to come into effect on the 1st of... 1st of September, uh, Chairperson. Unlike the other sectoral orders that came in instantly, but you may recall the yeah. last time we, there was a sectoral order brought in the construction sector, it, it, it came into effect, I think, early, early, um, uh, immediately, whereas this one will give contractors, and of all sizes, small and big, time and opportunity to accept that there will be an increase uh, on, on the 1st of September next. I think that's really important in, in, for, for the employers as well. And can I just ask one final question in relation to um, the terms will be binding across the sectors and enforceable by the Workplace Relations Commission. Um, will the Workplace Relations Commission, um, I suppose, have enough of employees to, to implement these terms and conditions? Because there's a couple of orders after coming now, and obviously that's going to involve more work. Um, for the work, Workplace Relations Commission. So it's just, um, you may not have the answer now. But I, I'm just I, I, well, I think I have because mm. we gave them extra resources oh, in good. the budget yeah. last year to deal with all these, including the, um, the new uh, responsibilities which they will have, um, and that will be coming before the House very soon, the Industrial, the industrial Relations Act, which will bring the Gardaí in line with, with okay. as, as recommended. So we did ensure uh, in Budget 2019-2020 that there would be extra resources put in. I think it's a budget in the region of one million euros extra. Okay. So I think that that will, that will deal with that. And I think Thank the you. important thing about this sectoral orders, because they have worked really well uh, so far up to now, uh, is that there, since the, uh, the, the uh, recommendations of the Employment Act came into place, there has been industrial, uh, industrial peace. I think that's really important, particularly now at a time when we see the construction sector on the rise and we see the demand for housing, the demand for commercial building. And uh, I think that um, you know, the, the, the act was really important to bring in all these areas, and um, I welcome it, and I'm delighted to be able to, as I say, my role is, very, is not that I, have to, I can scrutinize the role. I just, the process, make sure that the process, um, as laid out by the act, has been carried out by the Labour Court. And I'm fully satisfied that this has happened. Thank you very much, Minister. Back in there on the, um, Minister, you referenced Sarah Garley in the uh, uh, Industrial Relations Act coming before the thought tomorrow, and we Champagne is an amendment down to that on to include the Defence Forces. So I was wondering, have yourself or the Senior Minister given any thought to, to I'll be able it? to comment on that tomorrow, okay. uh, Deputy, in relation to that. I think we discussed that before when it went through the first stage, wasn't it, in the House itself. Yeah. And um, I think I think you know that I don't think the defence forces are in a position yet to be able to. But I mean, obviously, that's something we'll look at uh, down the line. And I know you've taken it in the in the current scenario was raised this morning uh, by the defence forces around the country. Uh, but we have to deal with what's 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 on the table at the moment, and, that, and that's with the Court of Okay, thank you very much. Um, this completes the committee's consideration of the sectoral employment order, electrical contracting sector 2019. 
The Clerk to the Committee will convey the following message to the Clerk of the Doyle and the Clerk of the Shannon. The Joint Committee on Business, Enterprise and Innovation has completed its consideration of the fa following order in draft. Sectoral Employment Order Electrical Contracting Sector 2019. I would like to thank the Minister Breen and his officials for attending the meeting today. I now propose we suspend briefly to allow Professor Clinch, the Chairperson Designate of Science Foundation Ireland, to take his seat. Is that agreed? Thank you. I would like to welcome Professor Peter Clinch, Chairperson Designate of Science Foundation Ireland. Before we commence, in accordance with procedure, I am required to read the following. By virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the Committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you are entitled, therefore, only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Can I also remind members, visitors and those in the public gallery to please ensure their mobile phones are switched off or in flight mode for the duration of this meeting as they interfere with the broadcasting equipment even when on silent mode. I now ask Professor Clinch to make his opening remarks to the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss with you my nomination as Chair Designate of Science Foundation Ireland. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your views and discussing mine regarding this exceptionally important agency. I'll firstly set out the details of my own qualifications. I'm currently in my final year of a five-year term as Chair of the National Competitiveness Council of Ireland, and I'll relinquish this role upon appointment as Chair of Science Foundation Ireland. 
I'm an economist who holds bachelor's, master's and PhD degrees and having led multi-million euro research projects and teams and being the author of numerous academic publications, I have a strong understanding of the research process, research funding, research evaluation and the process of peer review. Having published widely on cost-benefit analysis, I have a particular understanding of methodologies to evaluate performance and value for money. I have strong experience in the international research environment, having held visiting positions or been an invited speaker at, amongst others, the University of California, Berkeley in San Diego, Syed Business School at Oxford University, Cambridge University and the University of Southern California, and the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. I'm currently an affiliate faculty member of the Competitiveness Programme at Harvard Business School. I have advised or worked on behalf of, amongst others, the World Bank, OECD and several national governments and or their agencies. In 2017, I was conferred with a fellowship at the Academy of Social Sciences for distinguished research and contributions to policy. Between 2011 and 2014, I served as Vice President of University College Dublin with special responsibility for innovation, enterprise development and corporate partnerships. In this role, I gained extensive experience of senior management, corporate governance and evolved responsibility for portfolios. And as a founder of a startup company, Envicon Limited, I have direct experience of the pathway from education to research to innovation and enterprise development. My role as Chair of the National Competitiveness Council requires strong leadership, vision and management skills to bring a diverse set of interests and opinions together to provide advice to Government on Ireland's competitive position. It also involves having strong working relationships with the Department's senior officials, the Minister and the Erechthus. I also have strong relationships with IDA Ireland and Enterprise Ireland. I bring these attributes to my role as Chair of SFI. I have a significant international profile. For example, I have over 25 years' experience of interacting at a high level with European Commission officials, most recently around the European semester process. I currently have a strong presence at European level, representing Ireland as chair of our National Productivity Board under an EU Council and Government decision. I have worked at a senior level in the public service, civil service and in the private sector. I have made substantial policy contributions in economic policy, enterprise policy, innovation policy and environment and energy policy and have served on a number of government advisory boards including NESC, the NCC and the National Climate Council. My work in the civil service with the public service and as chair of the NCC gives me an important insight into the challenges faced by Ireland but also the challenges faced by Ireland's government, erectus, enterprise and public administration. In terms of my approach to being Chair of Science Foundation Ireland, it is clear that the Chairperson is responsible for leadership of the Board and must ensure the, its effectiveness in all aspects of its role. There are key tasks for the Chair as laid down in the guidance, however let me summarise what I see as some of the key tasks for the Board that I will chair. Presenting a clear picture of where SFI contributes to enterprise education and broader economic and social policy, working with the Minister, the Department, sister agencies and stakeholders through the promotion of excellence to deliver for the benefit of Ireland and its people, ensuring the organisation provides value for money for the taxpayer, being consistent uh, with the highest standards of corporate governance and compliance, setting a clear strategy, ensuring goals are met and that the processes by which they are met are consistent with good governance and practice ensuring the Director General and Executive operate effectively, efficiently and appropriately, promoting an organisational culture with equal opportunities that makes it a rewarding place to work, allows people to develop to their full potential and thereby ensures high standards of performance, and ensuring the public per perception and reputation of SFI is consistent with what I have just mentioned. I'd like to explain why I applied to be Chair of SFI. I am deeply committed to public service, the role of research, science and innovation and their relationship with skills development as key drivers of productivity in the workforce, in businesses and therefore a key component of Ireland's economic growth model and subsequently the economic and social welfare of Ireland's people. In my capacity as Chair of Ireland's National Productivity Board, I have been involved in many international meetings examining the alarming productivity trap in which some of the larger industrialised countries have found themselves. Economists have known since the 1990s that growth in economic output results from two things. One, an increase in the number of inputs, capital and labour that go into production, and two, improving productivity, developing new ways to get more output or a higher quality of output from a given level or combination of inputs. And the vast majority of an increase in output comes from improving productivity. As Nobel laureate Paul Krugman puts it, productivity isn't everything, but is nearly everything. And in the past, policy has had an important role to play both directly and indirectly in enhancing productivity. In the late 1950s, opening up to free trade. In the late 1960s, the free education scheme, joining the EEC in 1973, the establishment of the IFSC in the 1980s, and the low corporation tax rate and the work of the IDA in attracting FDI. 
the role and the role of Enterprise Ireland, the massive investment in infrastructure in the 1990s and 2000s, investment in science and innovation through the establishment of Science Foundation Ireland was and is a key policy intervention to enable Ireland to develop critical mass in science excellence. The Future Jobs Plan launched last March by Government has positioned productivity as a central pillar and science and innovation and their links to skills in the population are critical for growing a balanced economy but also for ensuring the continued performance of the multinational sector in Ireland and to secure the investment pipeline. So what is the role of SFI and what will be its role under my chairmanship? The economic evidence has shown the key role of innovation in both production and use of technology in terms of driving economic output. The presence of high quality universities, a strong human capital base, good education and a strong research base are, crit are crucial and this expertise spills over into the rest of the economy. Moreover, the economic evidence suggests the country's ability to absorb foreign technology is enhanced by investment in education and by investment in own R&D. A country cannot rely solely on imported R&D if it wants to be a leader in process innovation. Thus, I'm a firm believer in the importance of research in moving Ireland to the innovation frontier and securing Ireland's competitive position. In addition, effectively engaging and informing the public on the importance of research, providing high-quality research-informed teaching in our higher education institutions and building the pipeline for future researchers is critical. Basic research in the sciences is an essential investment for the long-term success of advanced economies. The creation of knowledge, even if the breadth of its application is uncertain, is, crucial, is critical for developing the basis for a knowledge-intensive and productive economy. Basic research provides the bedrock upon which applications emerge. The convergence of knowledge provides multiple benefits. Smart people doing smart things creates an absorption capacity in the economy to utilise knowledge created in other domains and jurisdictions. The overall human capital of the economy is enhanced. Applications emerge supporting innovation, spin-outs of companies, licensing and enterprise development and growth. At the same time, a strong science platform supports inward investment, results in more productive firms, provides higher quality employment and enables quality third-level research and form teaching, stimulating the researchers, entrepreneurs and innovators of tomorrow. And we know that science makes lives better. Since its establishment, SFI has developed an enviable reputation for Ireland as a location for excellent research. In 2018, Ireland ranked 12th in the world for scientific quality and 10th in the world in the Global Innovation Index. In the period 2010 to 2017, Ireland's innovation performance in a European context has also improved. The EU Innovation Scoreboard, which ranks us in ninth place, shows Ireland is considered a strong innovator, although we have some catch-up to do on the innovation leaders such as Sweden, Denmark, Finland and the, and the the Netherlands and the UK. In terms of the availability of talent, Ireland is ranked 21st, a fall of three places on the preceding year's score and down from a ranking of sixth in 2007. Both directly and indirectly, therefore, SFI has a critical role to play in enhancing Ireland's talent pool. As the National Competitiveness Council has pointed out, the returns from public investment in research can be difficult to assess and take time to measure. However, there is enough evidence to show public investment is crucial to stimulate private investment and to facilitate enterprise-led innovation creation and the diffusion of innovations. Irish expenditure in R&D as a percentage of GDP is below the EU average and that of the UK. This makes the delivery of the commitment set out in Innovation 2020 to increase combined public and private investment levels of R&D to 2.5% of GDP by 2020 very challenging, so it is vital that SFI remains highly efficient and effective in its operations and delivery for Ireland, developing strong collaborations with the higher education sector and with industry to obtain matching funding and to leverage talent in those organisations and to take advantage of funding opportunities with other jurisdictions at European level and through philanthropy. SFI also has a critical role to play in addressing the major societal challenges faced by humanity, such as climate change, an ageing population and health, the digital revolution and the impact of artificial intelligence on jobs and society, food security and many others. Dealing with these will be challenging for our society, economy and political system, and investment in research can identify and support solutions and indirectly contribute to more informed graduates so that Ireland can make its contribution to solving the world's most significant challenges. I am pleased to be nominated to join the board of SFI at a time when the agency has commenced developing its new strategy for the period 2020 to 2025. Under my chairmanship, this new strategy will focus on assisting Ireland in moving closer to the innovation frontier 
at the same time as meeting the global challenges just mentioned. Strategic investment in research is needed more than ever to ensure that we can compete internationally for talent and investment in a trading environment which is becoming more difficult. We live in a fast-changing world primarily due to technological advances and scientific discovery. Research will play an important role in future-proofing Ireland's creativity, skills, talent and the ability to innovate will be required to ensure we can compete in the future. The Board will ensure that the new strategy will focus on developing a highly skilled talent pool and a balanced portfolio of world-class research. I look forward to working across the research ecosystem, both nationally and internationally, with all of our partners, academic researchers, higher education institutions, industry schools, government departments, other agencies and funders, and other jurisdictions, including the European Union, amongst others, to realise the benefits of scientific research for Ireland, collaborating to build a more connected and vibrant research and innovation system. From my perspective, SFI has been an ambitious agency driving the delivery of excellence and innovation in our research system. SFI delivers at the leading edge of Ireland's economy. In recent years, the agency has made significant progress in building industry academic collaborations and partnerships nationally and internationally. These have been transformative in increasing industry R&D investment in Ireland. In many ways, the organisation will define the future shape of Ireland's economy through its programmes. Under my chairmanship, SFI will continue to do this through the pursuit of excellence and rigour in scientific research. As chair, I will ensure the highest standards of excellence will be adhered to, underpinned by strong competition and equal opportunities, with quality peer review, support of critical mass for high-quality research with impact through SFI centres, but also with supports for excellent research and performed by high-performing researchers with smaller teams, supports for research students and supports to fund research to address the major challenges faced by society. Collaboration is key both in both research, financial supports and across borders. SFI will continue to search for the appropriate balance between maintaining critical mass in research, the need to develop a pipeline of talent, programmes to support science at second level and to improve public engagement, and the necessity to bring top quality researchers to our shores. To conclude, Ireland's economic growth model our prosperity, our wage rates and our ability to finance public services, as well as our ability to contribute to solving the world's greatest challenges, will depend upon moving Ireland to the innovation frontier and securing Ireland's competitive position at a key moment of vulnerability in international trade. I have devoted my career to this agenda and will be pleased to perform this role for which, given that I am a public servant, I will receive no remuneration. As you know, I applied through the Public Appointment Service for this position. I am grateful to the Assessment Panel for putting me forward to the Minister, and I am honoured that the Minister for Business, Enterprise and Innovation, Heather Humphreys TD, has nominated me for this important role. As you will appreciate, I am not Chair yet, and so I am not privy to the details of the internal workings of SFI. Nevertheless, I am very glad to have had the opportunity to present uh, some principles today, and I very much look forward to hearing the views of the Committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Clinch, and I would just like to, um, before I open it to the floor, to congratulate you on being chairperson designate for the Science Foundation Ireland. Um, listening to you there, you have um, a lot of qualifications under your belt, there is no doubt about it, and you are very, very experienced. So who would like to start? Um, Senator Riley. First of all, to welcome you and to wish you well in your new position. We are not here to interview you as such, as you know that but rather just to engage if we could. I'm interested in the term you used, a productivity gap in some countries. Can you expand on that exactly what it means? Uh, secondly, I'm delighted to see that you're interested very much in improving research and improving the pool of talent we have. And so clearly, I would ask you what you feel the role of science, SFI, Science Foundation Ireland, would be in encouraging more people to take up STEM subjects, because we have this challenge uh, that a lot of people have shied away from it. Um, so we're not, we have a lot of very bright young people. We have one of the youngest populations in Europe. My own constituency has the youngest population in Europe, I think, and certainly in Ireland. So to encourage you know, girls in particular to go into this area of research, I think is critically important in terms of expanding the pool. And, and getting the best minds to address the issues of the day. And the last thing I just I would ask you to comment on is I've always been struck since I was Minister for Health at the fact that we have some of the best doctors in the world, some of the best universities in the world, 
the biggest pharma companies in the world here, the biggest IT companies in the world here, and the top 10 medical devices companies in the world here, and that synergies between those, if they can be brought together, must surely yield tremendous results into the future for us. And then that whole challenge that's always there of translating research into jobs. Thanks. Senator Professor Clinch. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, lots, lots of questions there. Uh, let me start with the productivity. So, um, as I mentioned, Krugman says productivity is everything. Essentially, in the long run, it's the best indicator of the sustainability of an economy. It tells us whether we're paying ourselves too much or, or, or too little. Um, so it's absolutely critical to prosperity uh, and countries that have managed to um, multiply their productivity or even nudge it by a small bit end up being, you can almost skip a generation in terms of the prosperity of the country. So it's absolutely critical. But what we're actually seeing in uh, developed, uh, many developed countries is negative total factor productivity growth. So essentially the, um, the ability to combine capital and labour together uh, is actually becoming less uh, effective. So in other words, we're seeing, we're seeing negative productivity growth. So that's one of the problems that Ireland has to try and avoid, that actually overall its productivity growth um, is, uh, stays positive. Now, Ireland has, has been very successful in keeping productivity uh, high. Um, we have very high productivity growth rates. But if you actually, the productivity trap or gap uh, that is mentioned is that what we ten have been seeing in the last decade is a tendency for that to concentrate. So in the Irish economy, for example, 90% of the productivity is delivered by 10% of the companies. So what we're seeing is the leading companies, those at the cutting edge, are, are maintaining, are driving all the productivity. And what we see is a long tail of, of Irish uh, companies that are actually have a static, you know, are stagnant or actually have declining productivity. So that's a big question mark for, for, policy, uh, for policy people as to how to actually help those uh, companies that are the, the followers rather than the leaders. Because in fact, it's those companies that provide most of the jobs. So what's the role of, of science uh, and research? Well, essentially uh, what science does is it, uh, it impacts directly in terms of novel ideas and innovations. And the theory is if you invest at the cutting edge and have lots of smart people doing lots of smart things, that there's a diffusion process where that knowledge spills out into the rest of the economy and helps those followers also come up uh, in terms of the productivity levels. Um, and the second area is that through having really good uh, research-led teaching in our universities and then also a, a strong knowledge of science to sort of move on to your, your, second, your third question really about bringing forward the, the pool, the second question about pool of talent, what it does then is it also um, uh, diffu the knowledge diffuses right out into the population in terms of people. And people are really what will drive um, will drive innovation as well as direct investment in research and innovation. Um, so what uh, people are concerned about is ensuring that it's not just the leading companies that engage in research and uh, that, that the research that's carried out in our public institutions, that also those ideas permeate through human capital, through people, through the workforce, and lead to a more educated workforce overall. And this is why it's critical then, your question around uh, the role of SFI in relation to education and public en engagement. And I'm delighted to see that SFI has a really strong focus on education and public uh, engagement. That helps this talent pipeline um, and also helps uh, society participate in discussions around science and the major challenges that we face, but ultimately will result in a much more productive workforce, which will also help to lift those companies uh, that have either stagnant or declining productivity. On the, the question about health, I think you're absolutely right. Um, one of the challenges in health is, of course, it takes very large investments to be, uh, to be effective. Um, it's an expensive business doing research in health, but I think you're right, and the, the structure of the centres uh, created by Science Foundation Ireland is around developing industry partnerships. So those partnerships between industry, uh, the public research um, system, uh, and also with the public sector, I think will significantly advance uh, our ability to do 
to be more innovative in that area. But I think we have to reflect on the fact that we've come an awful long way, that it's only 20 years really that we've been investing in, in research at this level. Science Foundation Ireland is about 20 years old, so what we've managed to achieve so far is really impressive, but there are areas where we can continue to improve. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Quinlivan. Thanks very much. Uh, <coughs> firstly, thank Professor, Professor Clinch for his, um, excuse me, his opening statement, and I think he's clearly demonstrated his considerable experience and expertise as to why he was nominated to be the Chair of Science Foundation. So on behalf of Sinn Féin, I'd like to wish Professor Clinch the very best in his role thank going you. forward. Um, Science Foundation Ireland does great work. I've met him a number of times, but sometimes I wonder if the public know enough about what they actually do and what they achieve and the successes they've had. So do you think more could be done to inform the general public about the good work that's done by Science Foundation? That's one of my questions there. Um, where do you think Science Foundation could improve or grow? What, what groups could go into? And would you like to see any particular new areas where Science Foundation should get involved with? Lord Thank you, Deputy. Thank you very much. So, um, to start with your first question, um, I think a really important role of the chair, well, let me start by saying uh, it, it can be actually quite difficult to, um, an, uh, SFI is an organisation, its main role is to disseminate funding in order to encourage the development of science, but it has some very important programmes in terms of its outreach. Uh, in terms of informing public engagement in science and also then reaching into the schools and also, as, as uh, Senator Riley said, in the gender area. So, nevertheless, it will be a focus for me that I think uh, you're probably right that as a fairly young organisation in the context of, uh, of enterprise agencies that uh, it still has a way to go in terms of um, reaching out to the public. Now, all of its programmes require uh, a dissemination uh, plan so I think that's an area where, uh, at the individual project level, that um, there is a significant effort on behalf of the organisation to ensure a greater impact, so it's research excellence with impact, a greater uh, clarity around the impact agenda. But I think also universities themselves and the higher education institutions are aware they also need to demonstrate impact. Um, but I think there's also a role for the board uh, and the executive in being very clear um, how SFI contributes, as I've explained, uh, to economic and social development. Um, and I hope I've set that here today, and it'll certainly be very high on my agenda in terms of, in fact, I think it was the number one thing I mentioned in my, in my, um, in my bullet points around what I think needs to be done. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the priorities for SFI, um, so I think I've, I've set out uh, in my opening statement, so I won't repeat what I think are the sort of ten main areas. But I think um, the priorities for SFI uh, that I would see is to ensure that the organisation continues to support this very strong research base. Um, and uh, as I'm joining the board, as the strategy is developing, uh, I think it's clear that Ireland still has some way to go to moving towards this innovation frontier. We are still followers, although we're probably top of the pack of followers. That's probably the way uh, I would describe it. I think at the same time, um, ensuring that the organisation also address some of the major societal challenges, such as climate change um, and artificial intelligence, which uh, I just mentioned. And I think also the need to uh, engage in ongoing horizon scanning uh, to ensure we are investing in the right areas. Um, so what uh, the strategy will focus on, uh, as I see it, is around developing, continue to focus on developing this highly skilled talent pool, but also a fairly balanced portfolio of research. Um, we'll also uh, focus on working across the ecosystem um, to deliver on that. Um, in terms of more specifics, I think uh, what's important is that there be a balance across uh, the sort of two main areas of funding, the developing existing, um, continuing to develop capacity through the research centres, so these are large scale collaborative centres involving industry and involving uh, multiple institutions, that we continue to invest in those and then secure that critical mass, but at the same time develop the pipeline of uh, new researchers and new ideas coming forward. Um, so 
The idea would be have both bottom-up proposals, so researchers coming forward with their proposals, um, and also open calls, and also then a top-down approach where uh, government or SFI identifies the need to build scale. Um, secondly, I think individual researchers across the career spectrum, from early stage to established highly esteemed individual research leaders will be supported, uh, supporting research teams in large scale or leading SFI research centres, so focusing on those sort of thematic areas of research that we have already, that's in pharmaceutical software, digital content, big data, telecommunications, photonics, medical devices, nanotechnology, marine and renewable energy, functional foods, applied geosciences, agri-food, advanced and smart manufacturing, neurological diseases and the bioeconomy. Um, so the focus will continue to be on excellence. So even if something is a, a great idea and there's a great challenge out there, we need to make sure that we're funding excellence and that will continue, um, not just funding something because we feel it needs to be, to be funded. Thank you. Uh, Senator Humphreys. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your, your opening statement. I think it's, it's very clear and very comprehensive. And, uh, I, uh, and you referred there in your answer to the, to the deputy in relation to your first bu bullet point is a presentation of a clear picture of where Science Foundation Ireland contributes to enterprise education and that. But the question I have for you, how do you deliver that? How do you deliver that clear picture? Because the SFI used to do these uh, breakfast br uh, briefings on occasion over in Buzzwells at 8 o'clock. Can I? To show the work that Science Foundation Ireland is doing and very comprehensive uh, and often what's not seen is not funded. Agreed. Uh, so how do, you, how, how do you think you can present that clear picture of the work that's been done? I think that's a, it's a really good question. It, it can often be, uh, be hard to articulate why this area is so important because There'll be many people who think, well, it's done by lots of smart people in white coats, that's not me. Uh, the reality is it's done by many more people like that, and quite often when, uh, you'll have seen from my presentation, quite often when people articulate about the science area, they talk about some major innovation. So this was, this sort of whole area of research was created, and maybe there's some sort of spin out in terms of a company or, or some ideas. I think what people totally fail to appreciate sometimes is it's really about people. So if you do not have a, a very strong research base, and our, Ireland didn't until 20 years ago when it started to be developed, if you don't have it, you cannot compete uh, as an advanced economy. So um, we firstly need to articulate everybody else is doing it, and if we don't do it, well, how can we possibly compete with them? So if we want to be a competitive economy, we have to invest in R&D. R&D not only creates uh, the sort of products and services of tomorrow, uh, and the jobs of tomorrow, it also develops the human capital of the population. So smart people doing smart things, that enables inward investment, more successful companies, but it also uh, helps us to use innovation created elsewhere and brought into the country. And I think something we certainly need to articulate is you can't rely, as I said, on imported <coughs> R&D. You know, we cannot continue to compete um, at a high level unless we improve um, the research intensity in the country, continue to improve the research intensity in the country. So uh, the mechanisms by doing that, I think SFI already touch on, on many of these, so reaching into the schools, encouraging them in the importance of science, ensuring that, uh, as, as the, the first senator said, as Senator Riley said, uh, that, we, that we examine gender um, and encourage through STEM, the take-up of STEM in, in gender, uh, and then also um, the ability to attract um, know-how and talent from abroad also relies upon also bringing in uh, expert researchers from abroad in areas where we don't have critical mass. So that's important as well. Um, I do think uh, there's a further role we can play, and I've already talked to the organisation about this. The organisation is certainly very key, very keen to continue to engage and engage more with the Erectus about about articulating what the organization is doing and why it is important. Because what I would like to see in the future is that you know, every member of the Oireachtas is, is, is an evangelist for this area mm. and, and uh, is able to articulate why it's critical to Ireland's future competitive advantage. So I would be very keen as chair 
to see that the organisation cooperates very heavily with the Oireachtas mm. uh, in the future. So very open to that. Like I would see there's a, there's, there's a gap in, in knowledge to the general public and people like yourself, I come from the pharmaceutical background. Uh, so if, if you can tie research and development, you can actually tie the industry to the country. You know, one right. links very strongly. You have better chance of keeping uh, the manufacturing element if you have the research and development in the same in the same in the same location. Uh, and I, I certainly know one company that has expanded hugely because of the benefit of, of R and D. Yes, and actually, if I, I could add to that, you're absolutely right. And what we're seeing now as well is that uh, the distance, the physical distance between R and D and actually the manufacturing activity or the services activity and the delivery to the customer is getting much smaller, as in uh, the, the, to rapidly introduce the innovations into actually product delivery is there to make that a much shorter period, they're bringing it together. So for Ireland, if we want to retain the investment we have, the multinational investment, but also bring our own companies up to that level, uh, it's absolutely critical, so I agree. No, thank you. Good. Apologies, we have a you have Janet, so I understand. Okay. And I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator McLachlan, we'll leave you in there. Yeah, um, <clears throat> again, congratulations on uh, your, your appointment, and uh, I have no doubt that you'll do a very fine job. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I, I was at an event uh, forum uh, recently in the city, and uh, the the universities and the institutes of technologies uh, were outlining um, the contribution they've made to you know, research and innovation, uh, working in partnership with businesses, uh, particularly in their catchment areas, um, but arguing the case for more investment. Uh, I just want to get a sense of, of where you see um, you know, SFI uh, uh, and in ter uh, you know, in terms of your relationship with the universities and the ITs, just to really get a sense of that. Uh, and then finally, um, what are the main challenges facing SFI? In your opinion, I appreciate you haven't assumed your role yet, but you know, uh, obviously, you, you wouldn't have been appointed without commanding a, a a real sense of where it's at now and where. It, you know, needs to go. So what are the challenges and how do you propose to deal with them? Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll sort of start with um, the funding environment. Um, one of the challenges is, is, maybe I'll start with the challenges question. I think that the, the significant challenge is um, how to so there's a commitment in, in Innovation 2020 to reach a certain research intensity, which is measured as a proportion of GNP, so 2.5%. And we're well off that. Well, why are we well off that? Well, partly because the, the economy has gone very well. So as a percentage of GNP, it gets harder to reach. Um, so that's going to make it critical that we work with um, universities, uh, institutes of technology, the new technological universities, to develop ways of, of achieving um, matching funding. So the CEO at the recent launch of the centres, um, Mark Ferguson, the recent launch of, of the centres, set out this model for a third, a third, a third funding. So a third state funding directly through SFI, because SFI only funds public institutions, but a third coming from industry, which already there's been a commitment to the centre, so that's already committed, uh, which is fantastic. And also a third raised in Horizon 2020 funding and Horizon Europe that comes after that. The significant challenge for the organisation will be to achieve those targets. Um, and under the new Horizon uh, Europe programme, uh, that the researchers also uh, are successful under that program. That's a slight risk for the organisation because actually the organisation itself doesn't raise the funding, it's the researchers in, in the institutions. So that's really the area where cooperation is critical. Uh, the other thing is in a constrained funding environment where you know, we have to be realistic that uh, I think all organisations would like more investment, um, but there are many competing, uh, competing um, areas for investment in the country at the moment. Um, so we'll certainly, the challenge for SFI is to make the case for that funding. Um, 
and to ensure that the funding is used efficiently. So I was looking at the numbers for SFI, I think it's very impressive that the organisation um, spends less than 7% of its budget on itself. So the vast majority is disseminated and I think that's a really positive, uh, positive thing um, and stacks up very well against other state organisations. So that is something we'll, we'll continue to push for efficiency uh, in the operation. I think also there are opportunities uh, to engage further. They're already um, there's good cooperation with four of the leading universities in the UK on, appoint on joint appointments. Uh, there have been very good negotiations with um, our counterparts in the UK and elsewhere on cooperating with other research funding agencies. And I think there's an opportunity in the North-South area uh, also uh, for greater cooperation. So those are sort of strategic areas that, that I would think are very important for uh, developing further funding. But I think there will always be a challenge. If, if, if SFI is successful, it will create more centres and generate more private funding than it will be able to fund. And as those centres are successful, they will continue, but more centres will come forward. At the same time, we need to bring through you know, the PhDs of tomorrow. If a very, SFI has a very large investment in, the, in, in PhDs at the moment, which is, is fantastic. But also, um, we have to bring through a pipeline of further researchers. So, you know, generally we might say, you know, there might be a 50-50 split in the funding, but as you become more successful, you have a shrinking, you have the same pot to spread over a larger number of, of, uh, of organisations and, uh, and structures and programmes. So that's, I think, the significant challenge for the organisation, but it relates very much to the other points of the panel, which is how do we sell that this is really important, uh, that for the medium term success of the economy, but also for people's well-being and for our ability to finance public services. This is absolutely critical. We cannot have the prosperity level that we have in this economy without having a very strong research base that secures our future. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Nevin? Yeah, thank you. Just to welcome the, the contributions from uh, Mr. Clinch. Um, and a lot of the questions I was going to ask have been answered already. Just, I suppose, kind of a broader a question, maybe more macro type question in relation to your, maybe your own subjective opinion on uh, ethics and science and technology and society um, and what your kind of vision is in relation to that, um, given that we're becoming more technologically focused um, and science being what it is, is, is about the matter in front. Um, and is there any vision in relation, and again, I said it, this is a very kind of a broad question in relation to empathy um, and how that can be indoctrined into the system, um, particularly for our younger graduates, given that everything is very data-driven now uh, and less kind of, I suppose, person-to-person -person interactive. It kind of goes back to the time of the 50s and 60s when atomic en energy was coming to the fore, but ethics were and became a part of that and what your vision might be on that, given that we're very data-driven now? Yeah, um, I think the, 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 the crucial place to start is around research ethics. Um, and uh, there's a national policy statement on research integrity, um, which was developed by the National Research Integrity Forum, of which SFI is a member. So um, that set out, sets out best practice um, in regards to approaches to research, uh, but also in the mechanisms for research undertaken in the HEIs. So SFI has a very clear policy on how to deal with that, and in its assessment and evaluation of programmes, uh, as I understand it, it takes it into account, but it, certain, it's a, it certainly uh, will while I'm chair. Um, in, uh, so in the terms and conditions of all of the contracts, that's, that's uh, specified. Um, and also it's developed uh, more assurance programs in that area um, and in fact I think it's so while there are, are very robust policies in place it's you have sort of pointed and I agree with you deputy to it's a very fast changing world so the organization will continually have to adapt so it may have a policy but I'm sure it'll have to adapt those policies as as new areas developed in terms of the ethics around for example um, the, uh, the, the use of data, um, the, uh, the use of personal data. Another area I'd say is, is going to be very important in this area. SFI has a very strict mandate around uh, STEM, you know, so um, nevertheless it has an ability to 
um, fund related research as part of a project which will focus more on the, the, the human aspect of it, perhaps sort of in areas like behavioral science, which can help us actually ensure that uh, the, sorts of, uh, the sort of knowledge, know-how that has to be applied uh, in order to ensure that the sorts of uh, research innovation that's coming out of the projects is actually going to be used for the benefit of society and effectively implemented, um, that we actually have the mechanisms to allow that to happen. So that sort of funding, uh, while not directly funded on its own, can be funded as part of, a, of an overall uh, project. So I think that's, that's critical as well, that we actually um, fund complementary research that sits alongside uh, the STEM research to ensure uh, that we avoid the sorts of, uh, of problems to which you, you, you referred in your question. Okay, I, and, and with that, just as a follow-on, I might be pushing it a bit here, would that, could that envisage in future maybe dipping your toe into the arts and humanities field as well, a crossover in relation to behavioral science? Well, I think, I think uh, the toe dipping is probably already happening. You can see it in certain projects that are funded uh, through the agency, but uh, the agency has a strict remit around STEM, so it would be a, a matter for uh, national policy for okay. the minister and the government to decide to change that remit. And uh, but there is uh, certainly, as part of the new strategy, I'm uh, absolutely sure that one area we will focus on is working very closely with the other funding agencies, such as the IRC, who do have that remit. We don't have to have a remit change in order to to actually address some of these issues working with other organisations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy. And Professor, if I could just ask you a question myself. Um, in this committee, we've heard a lot last year about CERN mm. and the fact that it's the world's largest and most respected centre for scientific research. And, uh, you know, we have debated here at this committee whether it would be... We, we have learned that it would be very advantageous for Ireland to be a member of CERN. Um, not only an associate member, but to be a member, but we also know that it's very, very costly. And I know it doesn't technically come under your remit, but do you think it would be advantageous to SFI if Ireland did become a member of CERN? Um, well, as I understand it, um, as you hinted at, uh, it is a matter for, uh, for the Minister and the yes. Department as to whether we join uh, CERN rather than uh, for SFI itself. And I know that... Um, any of the cases has been made clear to me, any of the cases made have to have a cost-benefit analysis yeah. to determine whether the money has been spent uh, appropriately and if it is really value for money for us to spend on that. But there's certainly no doubt if it was free, it would certainly be advantageous for us to join, okay. but I think it's reasonable to do an analysis on it. As I understand where it sits, we have associate membership of CERN um, and it's currently under review as to whether uh, we join. So it, I think... Um, uh, certainly it would be advantageous, but I think it depends upon the, the analysis of the numbers. Absolutely. We have discussed it here at this committee uh, for the last three years at different times with the Minister. Um, we, CERN, we, we, we had, um, they came before us last year and they were, you know, we learned an awful lot in relation to CERN because I, I didn't even realise, you know, the, the, the health advantages from CERN. You know, we learned a lot, but we also learned the cost as well. And I suppose, that, yeah, it was a kind of a hypothetical question. As you said, if it was free, it would be advantageous. So that kind of answers it. Any further questions? Okay. Um, Professor Clinch, I would like to thank you for engaging with the committee today. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to wish you every success and looking forward to meeting with you again in the future. I have no doubt you'll be back in front of us. The clerk to the committee will write to the minister informing her that we have completed our engagement with Professor Clinch and a transcript of this meeting will be provided. I now pre propose we go into private session. Is that agreed? Thank you. Thank you.